Chapter 19 of The Life of Harriet Beecher Stowe, compiled from her letters and journals by her son Charles Edward Stowe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 19 The Byron Controversy, 1869 through 1870. Mrs. Stowe's statement of her own case, the circumstances under which she first met Lady Byron, letters to Lady Byron, letter to dr holmes when about to publish the true story of lady byron's life in the atlantic dr holmes's reply the conclusion of the matter it seems impossible to avoid the unpleasant episode in mrs stowe's life known as the byron controversy it will be our effort to deal with the matter as colorlessly as is consistent with an adequate setting forth of the motives which moved mrs stowe to awaken this unsavory discussion in justification of her action in this matter mrs stowe says what interest have you and i my brother and my sister in this short life of ours to utter anything but the truth is not truth between man and man and between man and woman the foundation on which all things rest have you not every individual of you who must hereafter give an account of yourself alone to god an interest to know the exact truth in this matter and a duty to perform as respects that truth hear me then while i tell you the position in which i stood and what was my course in relation to it a shameless attack on my friend's memory had appeared in the blackwood of july eighteen sixty nine branding lady byron as the vilest of criminals and recommending the guiccioli book to a christian public as interesting from the very fact that it was the avowed product of lord byron's mistress no efficient protest was made against this outrage in england and littell's living age reprinted the blackwood article and the harpers the largest publishing house in america perhaps in the world republished the book its statements with those of the blackwood pall mall gazette and other english periodicals were being propagated through all the young reading and writing world of america i was meeting them advertised in dailies and made up into articles in magazines and thus the generation of to-day who had no means of judging lady byron but by these fables of her slanders were being foully deceived the friends who knew her personally were a small select circle in england whom death is every day reducing they were few in number compared with the great world and were silent i saw these foul slanders crystallizing into history uncontradicted by friends who knew her personally who firm in their own knowledge of her virtues and limited in view as aristocratic circles generally are had no idea of the width of the world they were living in and the exigency of the crisis when time passed on and no voice was raised i spoke End quote. it is hardly necessary to recapitulate at any great length facts already so familiar to the reading public it may be sufficient simply to say that after the appearance in eighteen sixty eight of the countess guiccioli's recollections of lord byron mrs stowe felt herself called upon to defend the memory of her friend from what she esteemed to be falsehoods and slanders to accomplish this object she prepared for the atlantic monthly of september eighteen sixty nine an article the true story of lady byron's life speaking of her first impressions of lady byron mrs stowe says i formed her acquaintance in the year eighteen fifty three during my first visit to england i met her at a lunch party in the house of one of her friends when i was introduced to her i felt in a moment the words of her husband quote, there was awe in the homage that she drew her spirit seemed as seated on a throne it was in the fall of eighteen fifty six on the occasion of mrs stowe's second visit to england as she and her sister were on their way to eversley to visit the rev c kingsley that they stopped by invitation to lunch with lady byron at her summer residence at ham common near richmond at that time lady byron informed mrs stowe that it was her earnest desire to receive a visit from her on her return as there was a subject of great importance concerning which she desired her advice mrs stowe has thus described this interview with lady byron 
after lunch i retired with lady byron and my sister remained with her friends i should here remark that the chief subject of the conversation which ensued was not entirely new to me in the interval between my first and second visits to england a lady who for many years had enjoyed lady byron's friendship and confidence had with her consent stated the case generally to me giving some of the incidents so that i was in a manner prepared for what followed those who accuse lady byron of being a person fond of talking upon this subject and apt to make unconsidered confidences can have known very little of her of her reserve and of the apparent difficulty she had in speaking on subjects nearest her heart her habitual calmness and composure of manner her collected dignity on all occasions are often mentioned by her husband sometimes with bitterness sometimes with admiration he says quote, though i accuse lady byron of an excess of self-respect i must in candour admit that if ever a person had excuse for an extraordinary portion of it she has as in all her thoughts words and deeds she is the most decorous woman that ever existed and must appear what few i fancy could a perfectly refined gentlewoman even in her femme de chambre End quote this calmness and dignity were never more manifested than in this interview in recalling the conversation at this distance of time i cannot remember all the language used some particular words and forms of expression i do remember and those i give and in other cases i give my recollection of the substance of what was said there was something awful to me in the intensity of repressed emotion which she showed as she proceeded the great fact upon which all turned was stated in words that were unmistakable mrs stowe goes on to give minutely lady byron's conversation and concludes by saying quote, of course i did not listen to this story as one who was investigating its worth i received it as truth and the purpose for which it was communicated was not to enable me to prove it to the world but to ask my opinion whether she should show it to the world before leaving it the whole consultation was upon the assumption that she had at her command such proofs as could not be questioned concerning what they were i did not minutely inquire only in answer to a general question she said that she had letters and documents in proof of her story knowing lady byron's strength of mind her clear-headedness her accurate habits and her perfect knowledge of the matter i considered her judgment on this point decisive i told her that i would take the subject into consideration and give my opinion in a few days that night after my sister and myself had retired to our own apartment i related to her the whole history and we spent the night in talking it over i was powerfully impressed with the justice and propriety of an immediate disclosure while she on the contrary represented the fatal consequences that would probably come upon lady byron from taking such a step before we parted the next day i requested lady byron to give me some memoranda of such dates and outlines of the general story as would enable me better to keep it in its connection which she did on giving me the paper lady byron requested me to return it to her when it had ceased to be of use to me for the purpose intended accordingly a day or two after i enclosed it to her in a hasty note as i was then leaving london for paris and had not yet had time fully to consider the subject on reviewing my note i can recall that then the whole history appeared to me like one of those singular cases where unnatural impulses to vice are the result of a taint of constitutional insanity this has always seemed to me the only way of accounting for instances of utterly motiveless and abnormal wickedness and cruelty these my first impressions were expressed in the hasty note written at the time london november fifth eighteen fifty six dearest friend i return these they have held mine eyes waking how strange how unaccountable have you ever subjected the facts to the judgment of a medical man learned in nervous pathology is it not insanity great wits to madness nearly are allied and thin partitions do their bounds divide but my purpose to-night is not to write to you fully what i think of this matter i am going to write to you from paris more at leisure 
the rest of the letter was taken up in the final details of a charity in which lady byron had been engaged with me in assisting an unfortunate artist it concludes thus i write now in all haste en route for paris as to america all is not lost yet farewell i love you my dear friend as never before with an intense feeling that i cannot easily express god bless you h b s the next letter is as follows paris december seventeenth eighteen fifty six dear lady byron the kansas committee have written me a letter desiring me to express to miss blank their gratitude for the five pounds she sent them i am not personally acquainted with her and must return these acknowledgments through you i wrote you a day or two since enclosing the reply of the kansas committee to you on that subject on which you spoke to me the last time we were together i have thought often and deeply i have changed my mind somewhat considering the peculiar circumstances of the case i could wish that the sacred veil of silence so bravely thrown over the past should never be withdrawn during the time that you remain with us i would say then leave all with some discreet friends who after both have passed from earth shall say what was due to justice i am led to think this by seeing how low how unworthy the judgments of this world are and i would not that what i so much respect love and revere should be placed within the reach of its harpy claw which pollutes what it touches the day will yet come which will bring to light every hidden thing there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed neither hid that shall not be known and so justice will not fail such my dear friend are my thoughts different from what they were since first i heard that strange sad history meanwhile i love you forever whether we meet again on earth or not affectionately yours h b s before her article appeared in print mrs stowe addressed the following letter to dr holmes in boston hartford june twenty sixth eighteen sixty nine dear doctor i am going to ask help of you and i feel that confidence in your friendship that leads me to be glad that i have a friend like you to ask advice of in order that you may understand fully what it is i must go back some years and tell you about it when i went to england the first time i formed a friendship with lady byron which led to a somewhat interesting correspondence when there the second time after the publication of dread in eighteen fifty six lady byron wrote to me that she wished to have some private confidential conversation with me and invited me to come spend a day with her at her country seat near london i went met her alone and spent an afternoon with her the object of the visit she then explained to me she was in such a state of health that she considered she had very little time to live and was engaged in those duties and reviews which every thoughtful person finds who is coming deliberately and with their eyes open to the boundaries of this mortal life lady byron as you must perceive has all her life lived under the weight of slanders and false imputations laid upon her by her husband her own side of the story has been told only to that small circle of confidential friends who needed to know it in order to assist her in meeting the exigencies which it imposed on her of course it has thrown the sympathy mostly on his side since the world generally has more sympathy with impulsive incorrectness than with strict justice at that time there was a cheap edition of byron's works in contemplation meant to bring them into circulation among the masses and the pathos arising from the story of his domestic misfortunes was one great means relied on for giving it currency under these circumstances some of lady byron's friends had proposed the question to her whether she had not a responsibility to society for the truth whether she did right to allow these persons to gain influence over the popular mind by a silent consent to an utter falsehood as her whole life had been passed in the most heroic self-abnegation and self-sacrifice the question was now proposed to her whether one more act of self-denial was not required of her namely to declare the truth no matter at what expense to her own feelings 
for this purpose she told me she wished to recount the whole story to a person in whom she had confidence a person of another country and out of the whole sphere of personal and local feelings which might be supposed to influence those in the country and station in life where the events really happened in order that i might judge whether anything more was required of her in relation to this history the interview had almost the solemnity of a deathbed confession and lady byron told me the history which i have embodied in an article to appear in the atlantic monthly i have been induced to prepare it by the run which the guiccioli book is having which is from first to last an unsparing attack on lady byron's memory by lord byron's mistress when you have read my article i want not your advice as to whether the main facts shall be told for on this point i am so resolved that i frankly say advice would do me no good but you might help me with your delicacy and insight to make the manner of telling more perfect and i want to do it as wisely and well as such story can be told my post office address after july first will be westport point bristol county massachusetts care of mrs i m soule the proof sheets will be sent you by the publisher very truly yours h b stowe in reply to the storm of controversy aroused by the publication of this article mrs stowe made a more extended effort to justify the charges which she had brought against lord byron in a work published in eighteen sixty nine lady byron vindicated immediately after the publication of this work she mailed a copy to dr oliver wendell holmes accompanied by the following note boston may nineteenth eighteen sixty nine dear doctor in writing this book which i now take the liberty of sending to you i have been in a critical place it has been a strange weird sort of experience and i have had not a word to say to anybody though often thinking of you and wishing i could have a little of your help and sympathy in getting out what i saw i think of you very much and rejoice to see the hold your works get on england as well as this country and i would give more for your opinion than that of most folks how often i have pondered your last letter to me and sent it to many friends god bless you please accept for yourself and your good wife this copy from yours truly h b stowe mrs stowe also published in eighteen seventy through sampson low and son of london a volume for english readers the history of the byron controversy these additional volumes however do not seem to have satisfied the public as a whole and perhaps the expediency of the publication of mrs stowe's first article is doubtful even to her most ardent admirers the most that can be hoped for through the mention of this subject in this biography is the vindication of mrs stowe's purity of motive and nobility of intention in bringing this painful matter into notice while she was being on all hands effectively and evidently in some quarters with rare satisfaction roundly abused for the article and her consequent responsibility in bringing this unsavory discussion so prominently before the public mind she received the following letter from dr o w holmes boston september twenty five eighteen sixty nine my dear mrs stowe i have been meaning to write to you for some time but in the midst of all the wild and virulent talk about the article in the atlantic i felt as if there was little to say until the first fury of the storm had blown over i think that we all perceive now that the battle is not to be fought here but in england i have listened to a good deal of talk always taking your side in a quiet way backed very heartily on one occasion by one of my most intellectual friends reading all that came in my way and watching the course of opinion at first it was to be expected that the guiccioli fanciers would resent any attack on lord byron and would highly relish the opportunity of abusing one who like yourself had been identified with all those moral enterprises which elevate the standard of humanity at large and of womanhood in particular after this scum had worked itself off there must necessarily follow a controversy none the less sharp and bitter but not depending essentially on abuse 
the first point the recusants got hold of was the error of the two years which contrived to run the gauntlet of so many pairs of eyes some of them were made happy by mouthing and shaking this between their teeth as a poodle tears round with a glove this did not last long no sensible person could believe for a moment you were mistaken in the essential character of a statement every word of which would fall on the ear of a listening friend like a drop of melted lead and burn its scar deep into the memory that lady byron believed and told you the story will not be questioned by any but fools and malignants whether her belief was well founded there may be positive evidence in existence to show affirmatively the fact that her statement is not peremptorily contradicted by those most likely to be acquainted with the facts of the case is the one result so far which is forcing itself into unwilling recognition i have seen nothing in the various hypotheses brought forward which did not to me involve a greater improbability than the presumption of guilt take that for witness that byron accused himself through a spirit of perverse vanity of crimes he had not committed how preposterous he would stain the name of a sister whom on the supposition of his innocence he loved with angelic ardour as well as purity by associating it with an infamous accusation suppose there are some anomalies hard to explain in lady byron's conduct could a young and guileless woman in the hands of such a man be expected to act in any given way or would she not be likely to waver to doubt to hope to contradict herself in the anomalous position in which without experience she found herself as to the intrinsic evidence contained in the poems i think it confirms rather than contradicts the hypothesis of guilt i do not think that butler's argument and all the other attempts at invalidation of the story avail much in the face of the acknowledged fact that it was told to various competent and honest witnesses and remains without a satisfactory answer from those most interested i know your firm self-reliance and your courage to proclaim the truth when any good end is to be served by it it is to be expected that public opinion will be more or less divided as to the expediency of this revelation hoping that you have recovered from your indisposition i am faithfully yours o w holmes while undergoing the most unsparing and pitiless criticism and brutal insult mrs stowe received the following sympathetic words from mrs lewes george eliot the priory twenty one north bank december tenth eighteen sixty nine my dear friend in the midst of your trouble i was often thinking of you for i feared that you were undergoing a considerable trial from the harsh and unfair judgments partly the fruit of hostility glad to find an opportunity for venting itself and partly of that unthinking cruelty which belongs to hasty anonymous journalism for my own part i should have preferred that the byron question should never have been brought before the public because i think the discussion of such subjects is injurious socially but with regard to yourself dear friend i feel sure that in acting on a different basis of impressions you were impelled by pure generous feeling do not think that i would have written to you of this point to express a judgment i am anxious only to convey to you a sense of my sympathy and confidence such as a kiss and a pressure of the hand could give if i were near you i trust that i shall hear a good account of professor stowe's health as well as your own whenever you have time to write me a word or two i shall not be so unreasonable as to expect a long letter for the hours of needful rest from writing become more and more precious as the years go on but some brief news of you and yours will be especially welcome just now mr lewes unites with me in high regards to your husband and yourself but in addition to that i have the sister woman's privilege of saying that i am always your affectionate friend m h lewes End of chapter 19, read for you by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana.